Hi, this is Ryan. Welcome to another week of the Behavior, Evolution, and Culture Speaker Series. We meet every week of the academic year in this room at this time. And before I introduce today's speaker, I'm just going to give you a little preview of the next couple of weeks. So next Monday, October 22nd, Eduardo Guerra Amaram from here at UCLA is giving a talk entitled Migration and Social Organization in Medieval Europe, a Paleogenomic Approach. In the following week, um, October 29th, Daniel uh, Benishek is coming from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and his talk is entitled Human Maternal uh, Placenta Phagy, Evolutionary Roots, Cross-Cultural Occurrence, and an Emerging Post-Industrial Health Trend. So look forward to those. The rest of the talks um, uh, for the quarter, the titles are all up, and the speakers for the rest of the year are on the website at beck.ucla.edu. This week, I'm really happy to introduce Sarah benson Amram, who's coming from the University of Wyoming, but is in California currently, so we're happy to have her talking about individual social and ecological influences on problem solving. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It's been a great pleasure to be here today. Um, I've been really enjoying my meetings so far. I look forward to meeting more of you uh, this afternoon. So today, I want to tell you about some of the work that's been going on in my lab at the University of Wyoming, uh, where we're mostly focused on trying to understand uh, animal cognition, both in terms of thinking about um, how intelligence evolved and also in thinking about how different social and ecological environments can affect the expression of different cognitive traits. And one uh, environment that we're particularly interested in lately in my lab is uh, cities. And so when wildlife first encounter cities, there's a host of problems that they need to solve. They need to learn how to deal with new predators and competitors. They need to learn how to um, acquire different uh, Food resources, they need to learn new navigation strategies so they don't get hit by cars when crossing the road or so they can find their way around this really new environment. And they even need to potentially adjust their communication to deal with different um, and increased levels of background noise. And an animal's ability to solve all of these types of problems in these urban environments can greatly impact its fitness. And there's a hypothesis that's been put forward uh, in recent years to, to try and understand um, how animals are able to survive in complex and changing environments. And this, the cognitive buffer hypothesis suggests that the primary adaptive function of an enlarged brain is to buffer individuals against environmental change by facilitating the construction of novel behavioral responses. And um, although there's this often assumed connection here between um, brain size and intelligence, uh, there's actually not much empirical evidence to support that connection. So uh, the first study I want to tell you about is one in which my colleagues and I set out to really try and understand um, how does brain size influence um, or correlate with success on a problem solving task. And so um, this was work done in collaboration, collaboration with Ben Dancer, Greg Stricker, Eli Swanson, and Kay Holkamp uh, at Michigan State University. And in order to test this, we traveled to nine zoos across the country, and we presented a novel problem-solving task to 153 individuals from all of the species presented here um, from uh, nine families across the order of Carnivora. And the problem-solving task that we gave them was a puzzle box. So this is something that they hadn't seen before. It's a really large, very heavy metal box. Um, and there's slats that the animals can see and smell through. And inside the box, there's a favorite food reward of the animal, which um, is told to us by the keepers. So in order to access this food reward, the animals have to slide a latch, which you can see here, in a lateral direction, this allows a door to swing open and they can then access the food from inside. We had two different sized boxes. As you can see, this river otter um, and the main wolf are interacting with a smaller box which, um, in an attempt to accommodate for uh, variation in body size. I'm sorry, that's okay. So um, we tried to give each individual at least three trials with this box. Trials lasted 30 minutes. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the box was baited with the favorite food reward of the animal as, uh, as a way to try and have high motivation across all participants. So this kawadi is going to get uh, some hard boiled eggs, whereas uh, this panda gets a yummy uh, bamboo treat. And we then took 
uh, measures of body size, of grain volume, and of different si gross grain um, regions from the published literature. And we use phylogenetic comparative statistics to determine whether these measures um, predicted performance on this task. And as you can see, some animals were less successful than others. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, as I said, we tested 153 individuals from 41 species across nine families within the order of carnivora, all of which are uh, represented here. And of those, uh, 46 individuals from 23 species across eight families were successful. The only family that didn't have a successful individual was the Hephaestidae, so the meerkats and the mongooses. When we looked at um, how brain size measures um, relate to problem solving success, we found that um, as predicted, species with larger relative brain volumes were in fact more successful on this task. So this is our uh, residual brain volume, our measure of brain size um, given body size. and um, here's success at um, solving this task. And we also did look at absolute brain volume, um, and that did also predict uh, success on this task, but not as well as relative brain volume. The model that had relative brain volume was um, a stronger model. We also looked at the sizes of four different gross brain regions, and again, inclusion of those brain regions in our models improved fit of those models in some cases, but still the, the best overall predictor of success on the task was this measure of um, relative brain volume or brain volume control for a um, So uh, now having es established some empirical evidence to support this connection between brain size and enhanced cognitive abilities, we do think that the cognitive buffer hypothesis um, offers some strong support or is strongly supported in some respects for the evolution of intelligence, at least within carnivores. And we're now looking at this um, hypothesis in a number of different ways. Currently in my lab, what we're, we're trying to do is taking species that are very successful in new, unusual, or complex environments and asking whether or not they do in fact exhibit uh, enhanced domain general cognitive abilities. And in particular, if they uh, exhibit uh, heightened abilities to express new or modified behaviors. And to do that, we're looking at a measure that uh, we call behavioral flexibility. Behavioral flexibility is a really sort of multifaceted cognitive trait, um, and it encompasses a number of different cognitive abilities within it. So um, innovative problem solving is one, so being able to solve a problem, uh, a new problem, or being able to solve an old problem in a new way. Um, learning solutions to problems, Social learning, so learning by observing others. Uh, repeated innovation, so solving a problem not just um, in one way, but actually being able to solve it in different ways. And then also looking at inhibitory control, which can be thought of as an animal's ability to basically stop expressing a behavior that used to be productive and no longer is. So a good way to think about this is a raccoon comes across a trash can and it learns to flip open the lid and get some yummy trash. And now the homeowner is annoyed by that, so they put a bungee cord on top. When the raccoon next encounters this trash can, does it continue to try and flip up the lid even though that's no longer working for it? Or does it switch behaviors and try a different way to open the trash can, such as sliding the bungee cord off? And that time it takes them uh, sort of working on that old solution before they figure out a new one is a measure of inventory. Uh, so we are um, looking at behavioral flexibility in two very successful carnivores, uh, the spotted hyena and the raccoon. Um, the spotted hyena is the most abundant large carnivore throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. They're incredibly successful across a huge range of different habitat types. Uh, they also eat pretty much anything they come across. Um, they're very good hunters. Um, so they have this really sort of opportunistic generalist lifestyle. Uh, they're also incredibly successful in some cities, especially in Ethiopia. There's some famous populations that are very well tolerated in cities. Um, as you can see, they're found on the streets. They're also very commonly found in the city's uh, trash dumps. And so they are able to both sort of be very successful in their natural savanna habitat as well as um, uh, adapt to uh, anthropogenically disturbed environments. And I don't have time to tell you too much about the hyena work um, in this talk because there's a lot I want to tell you about the current work going on in my lab, but I just felt like I had to at least mention a couple of studies. So in brief, um, 
is part of my uh, dissertation work. I went to Kenya and I studied um, a clan of spotted hyenas there, and we presented them. This was all done in collaboration with Keho Clan. We presented them with a, um, a novel problem solving task, very similar to the one you saw in that comparative video. Um, and we asked, can hyenas solve a problem we've never seen before? If they solve it, do they learn the solution? Do they improve over time? And what differentiates individuals who learn the solution to the problem, so this animal in the front has learned how to open this box, from ones that never learn the solution, although this one is very clever in its own way. However, most of our animals were like Alan here, who really, he's, he's drooling. <laughs> he really <laughs> wants this meat, but he just can never figure it out. And he would spend hours just staring at the box. <laughs> so, why does Alan fail, whereas other animals succeed? Um, and so first, I should say, we did have hyenas solve this problem, so they do show innovative problem solving. Uh, about 15% of our population, about 9 out of 62 animals that actually approached the box, uh, were successful. So it's a pretty low success rate overall in the wild, uh, but those animals that were successful learned the solution to the problem. So here we have average work time to open um, across trials. And as you can see here, animals take you know, uh, several minutes initially to figure out the solution to the problem, but they become significantly faster at opening the box as they gain experience with it. And this, uh, the shape of this learning curve, this jagged shape, is indicative of trial and error learning. However, going back to those videos and thinking about what differentiates successful from unsuccessful animals, one thing I was really struck by, because I was watching you know, thousands of hours of videos, was the diversity of behaviors that some animals exhibit when interacting with the problem. And so we thought we wanted to quantify that diversity, and so we came up with a measure of, of exploration diversity. So this is the number of different exploratory behaviors that an animal exhibits when first interacting with the problem. And um, this can be things such as digging or investigating, like sniffing uh, or licking, biting, flipping, or dragging the box. We thought that animals who do more of these things, who try more things, when they first encounter a new problem, will be more successful. Uh, and that was, in fact, the case. So here's our uh, exploration diversity score and our overall success. And you can see here that animals that try more things in their first trial are eventually more successful at solving the problem. We also saw tremendous variation in the amount of exploratory diversity that these animals exhibited when interacting with the problem. So here's our mean exploratory diversity score per individual across all of their trials. And we've now lined up all of the hyenas that participated from those hyenas that exhibited basically no behaviors to those that exhibited a diversity of behaviors. Um, so you can see here there's quite a range um, in terms of the average uh, numbers of behaviors that these animals are trying when they're trying to solve this problem. Um, I've also colored in the successful animals, and you can see that they really cluster at this end of the range. Um, if you try and uh, look at rank um, or sex, you don't see any pattern emerge here. So it does seem to be that this is, success on this problem seems to be really driven by individual traits, either um, something akin to personality or, or different individual differences in cognitive abilities. Um, so there's a lot more hyena work to talk about, but I don't have time in this talk, although I'm happy to chat about um, it with any of you afterwards. But I, want, I wanted to um, quickly shift gears and tell you about the work we have going on right now with our raccoons. So raccoons um, are very uh, ubiquitous throughout North America. They've been incredibly successful at expanding throughout North America. Um, they've also been introduced in parts of Europe and Asia, and they've also been um, successful in establishing um, populations. When we think about raccoons, we often have this type of image in our mind, right? These city-dwelling animals um, that are very sort of adept at moving around our cities. Uh, and most people, if you ask them to describe raccoons, will say, oh, they're very smart and they're, you know, big pests because they break into my house and my trash can and whatever it might be and cause problems. Um, so, but however, despite a lot of people thinking that these animals are really smart, if you actually go to the literature, there's, we, we know surprisingly little about <coughs> raccoon behavior and cognition. And so um, when I set up my lab at the University of Wyoming, I really wanted to start just trying to get a picture of what, how, how smart are these animals? What kinds of problems can they solve? What, do we really, what can we learn about raccoon cognition? And how might um, cognition be facilitating their adaptation to urban environments? <coughs> 
And so uh, we started the University of Wyoming Raccoon Project in 2015. Um, the project um, has a PhD student, Lauren Stanton. Uh, this is Sarah Daniel. She was a master's student in the lab um, who recently graduated. This is Rachel Finelli. She was an undergraduate student in the lab who's now our project manager. And then we've had a host of um, undergraduate students who've been incredibly important in getting this project um, up and running and in collecting the data that we've been able to collect. So far we have 157 raccoons that we've trapped. Um, and every time we trap an animal, we collect a, a number of different biological samples from them, uh, fecal samples, blood samples, whisker samples, hair, me body measurements. We get as much as we can from the animals while we have them. Um, and then we also put a pit tag in them, which is like a, um, microchip that your dog would get at the vet. So it basically allows us to scan these animals and know who they are um, based on this uh, pit tag that's in, in between their shoulder blades. We've also had a handful of um, radio collars on these animals because we're trying to, in addition to our experimental work, also just gain an understanding of their flexibility of space use and how their home ranges um, might differ in this population versus others uh, and looking at just how active they are and when, things like that. Uh, in addition to our wild population in Laramie, we also have access to a captive facility. So there's a um, USDA APHIS uh, National Wildlife Research Center in Fort Collins, Colorado. It's about an hour and 20 minutes from Laramie. And they have um, uh, captive raccoons and skunks that they regularly keep there for their own studies, but we get to come in and do some of our um, experimental work with them sort of as enrichment for their animals. And so the first study I want to tell you about with the raccoons was done in this captive facility. Uh, and this study was led by Lauren Stanton, the PhD student on this project. And for this study, we were really interested in trying to understand how, um, how raccoons fare on some sort of classic test of animal cognition. <coughs> because we really didn't know much about them, we wanted to just get a general idea of how they're doing relative to some other species that have been studied. And we picked this task because they um, raccoons really like to manipulate objects, they're very comfortable with water, so we thought they might do well on a task like this Aesop's Fable test. So the Aesop's Fable test is a um, sort of classic test of trying to understand cause, cause and effect understanding in animals, and it's based off of an Aesop's Fable, the crow in the pitcher. So in this fable, a thirsty crow comes along, it finds a pitcher of water, but the water level is too low for the crow to reach it. and uh, the clever crow says, oh, if I pick up these rocks and I put them in this pitcher, the water level will rise and I can then uh, get a drink. And so the crow does that. And so um, this has been adapted in tests of animal cognition, mostly used in birds and with human children. As I said, to try and understand how much do these animals really um, know about a cause and effect relationship. Basically, if you drop stones in, the water level rises. And so we adapted this for the raccoons. Um, we designed a base that we thought would be too heavy for the raccoons to knock over. Um, we asked everyone, what's the heaviest thing you've ever seen a raccoon move? And we made it heavier. Uh, we measured their arms so that we would know what uh, height the water, where the water should be. Um, as you can see, and you'll see in the video, they really jammed their shoulders in there. So there was a little bit of learning on that. Um, and we had water um, that had a floating marshmallow reward. And so because this task had not yet been conducted with raccoons or even um, any carnivore for that matter, we first wanted to say, can they just solve this on their own? If we just present them with this problem, will they figure it out? Um, and the answer is no, they don't. Um, this is not very surprising. This is very much in line with the other studies, all of the other studies. Um, that have been done with non-human animals have required training of those animals to first learn this association. And then those tests, uh, those studies have gone on to do a series of choice tests to really probe the level of understanding that the animals gain. They've all required initial training. So we then moved on to a training phase. And in the training phase, we basically balance uh, rocks on this lip here that we built on this tube. So the animals, when just interacting with the device and walking around, would accidentally drop stones in. So hopefully they would learn that association. Um, four of the raccoons that we tested were able to retrieve marshmallows in this phase of testing, and one of them actually started dropping stones in intentionally. And then we moved on to um, our final trials, our sort of testing trials, where uh, we asked them, OK, now that the stones are back on the ground, have you figured this out? Do you actually put stones in? And so the brother 
uh, of Requiem 29 started dropping stones in the Littermate brother. And then the Littermate sister actually solved it in her own unique way. So she learned that if she basically holds onto the top of the tube and puts her feet on the bottom and rocks her body back and forth, she can flip the whole thing. <laughs> so, you know, different ways of doing it. This is our, um, just an example of a trial, just so you can see. It's, sorry, the, the consequence of studying nocturnal animals is often bad videos. But, um, yeah, they really sort of get in there. And get their marshmallow reward. Um, so as I mentioned, in these other studies, you once these animals have learned to drop the stones, and you then give them choice tasks to see how, how well they understand this um, problem. And so we started giving the raccoons <coughs> we gave them three choice tasks. So here we had size of rocks. So we either gave them small rocks or big rocks. Presumably, if they understand this task, they should choose preferentially choose the bigger rocks, which raise the water level more efficiently than the smaller rocks. Um, they do not. Raccoons are a whole different type of animal. We have learned, and instead of um, carefully selecting one stone and then another, like the birds that have been tested and then stopping once they get the reward, raccoons basically take everything and dump it in. So even after they've received the reward, they still just keep playing with the device. Um, so I don't think that this is very meaningful in terms of actually understanding how much they understand. I think it's more meaningful in terms of understanding how raccoons are interacting with the world. We then gave them uh, balls that look identical except for these numbers, uh, but differ in density. So some of these balls are hollow, some are filled with sand, so some float and some sink. Um, presumably, if they understand this task, they should choose the dense balls that sink, uh, and they should not preferentially uh, choose the floating balls. Uh, they do not. So again, we were curious about this, and it, it turns out what they actually have done is they turn the floating balls into functional choices. So they take the floating balls, and then they, they do this, and they splash the marshmallow on the sides of the tube, and then they get their reward. So again, this sort of classic test and these uh, classic assessments aren't telling us actually how much raccoons understand about the task. They're telling us the raccoons solve problems in new and creative ways. We did finally find a non-functional choice for them. So here is corn cob bedding um, that a marshmallow is placed on top of, and here's their standard water tube. And we said, OK, if you understand this task, you should preferentially drop stones into the water, uh, not the corn cob bedding. Um, and they actually do that. So once we found an option for them that really wouldn't get them a reward, they did what we predicted. OK, so um, in our second sort of assessment of raccoon cognition, we wanted to get out into the field, and we wanted to test innovative problem solving in wild raccoons. And so this is again led by Lauren Stanton, and um, she designed this very clever uh, puzzle box that has multi multiple compartments. So it actually has 12 compartments on each side, and each compartment can be open, is open in the same way for this box. So again, it's very similar to the previous boxes where they have to slide a latch in the lateral direction to open the door and there's a kibble inside. Um, and we did this because raccoons are nocturnal and we didn't want to be going out there multiple times in the night to rebate a single puzzle box and um, have it be very disruptive. So we left this out with the hope that even if a raccoon just shows up for one night, we'll still be able to look at learning um, and calculate the learning curve if they open multiple boxes within even just one night. Um, so here's an example of one of these trials. Um, and so here's a wild raccoon. You can see it has a radiant color opening up compartments. What you can almost see here, there's a little antenna coil around this site. And so when the raccoons walk and approach the box, they get their pit tag scanned. So this tells us uh, who each individual is, their arrival time, and their departure time. And then we also have, um, because it's in the wild, a lot of trials in which we have multiple animals present at the same time. So um, this study is still very much in, uh, I'm in preparation. So we've conducted these experiments for two field seasons. What I'm going to show you are the data from the first field season. We're still extracting the behavioral data from um, many of the videos. So we don't yet have all of the, the data in. But so far, um, we do have raccoons solving this problem. Um, and the raccoons that solve it are, are learning the solution. So here's again our, our learning curve where we have mean time to open with number of doors open. And you can see here the raccoons start out taking longer time and then as they gain experience, they become quite fast at opening each compartment. 
Um, six out of the 15 raccoons were successful on this task, and we had three super solvers who opened over 70 doors each. So this is, for, again, from the first field season, we're adding the second field season's worth of data, or second field season's data to this. Um, and we're also going to extract more behavioral measures. We then, in order to look at not just um, innovative problem solving, but actually to look at repeated innovations and get a better picture of overall behavioral flexibility in these animals, we wanted to do um, a multi-compartment puzzle box test. So this is now back in captivity. This is a uh, work led by Sarah Daniel. And um, in this task, we designed a puzzle box that, had, that could be opened in three different ways. So instead of just our classic opening, we actually have a sort of window that they can pull out, or sorry, a door they can pull out and a window that they can slide up to access a food reward inside. Uh, and this allow, this type of task allows us to look at repeated innovation and also ideally inhibitory control. So can they solve one problem in different ways? And um, as you'll see here, we gave this to the raccoons on one night, on night one, with all three solutions available. If a raccoon found one solution type, if they open one solution type at least um, three times, then they move on to night two of testing. If they fail to solve the same solution type at least three times, then they're out of the experiment. So on night two, they see this box again, but now the solution that they had opened, let's say the latch, is locked. So now if they want to get this food reward, they have to open the box in a different way. Um, and so the time they spend sort of perseverating on that locked solution before they open the box in a new way is, is a measure of in inhibitory control. Uh, so for night two, if they solve a new solution type three times, they move on to night three, where now they're receiving the puzzle box with their two previously solved solutions locked. So now there's only one solution available to them. Uh, and we found that captive raccoons are either completely unsuccessful or quite successful. Um, so either they find no solutions or they find multiple solutions. We did not actually have any animals fall into this one solution category. So we do see that they're, able, they're capable of repeated innovations, but we aren't able to do the classic comparison to look at in inventory control. We did compare two to three time problem solvers and found no difference in our measure of inhibitory control, but we're now assessing inhibitory control between raccoons that are all quite flexible in their behavior. Interestingly, when we look at um, exploration diversity in between two and three time solvers, we find a difference. So animals um, that try more things, even in their um, third night of testing, are more successful than animals that are trying fewer things. So exploratory diversity is very critical in sort of first time innovative problem solving and it's also really critical in terms of an ability to do to exhibit repeated innovations. Uh, we then moved this type of design out into the wild and so we've transitioned our multi-compartment puzzle box into a multi-solution puzzle box. So here we now instead we have the same number of doors but now instead of them all being opened in the same way we have four different solution types. So we have our classic uh, latch solution type here and here this H, but then we also have a swivel solution, a vertical solution, and a rod solution. So an animal in one night can come to the puzzle box, open the, all the compartments it knows how to open, but then if it wants to keep getting rewarded, it has to open the box in a new way. And so um, again, these data are still um, being extracted from the videos, but so far, oh sorry, so far we know, we're seeing the exact same pattern in the field that we were seeing in captivity. So we either have raccoons that aren't able to solve anything, or raccoons that learn uh, that open multiple solutions. And we don't again have any of these single solution uh, individuals. Um, so far, we in the first field season had 13 raccoons that participated. Seven of them were successful, um, but again, we're going to add add more data to this with our second field season. Of, uh, As I mentioned. At these experimental sites, we, uh, we have arrival and departure information for each individual. And so from that, um, Rachel Finelli is leading an effort to uh, look at social networks. So basically, we take our pit tag data, and we can tell who is at these experimental sites at the same time. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with social networks, um, basically each of these nodes here is an individual, and the, um, the width of the line connecting them shows the strength of their association. So how much time they were present at these sites at the same time. And um, one thing to take away from this first is that raccoons are much more social than we thought. So 
So historically, they've been thought of as a pretty solitary animal. Our data from our um, study system, as well as some um, uh, work in Chicago and other places, are showing are showing that raccoons are actually more social than we thought. So here we have three sort of distinct communities of adults that are connected by this really strong core of juveniles. Uh, and other studies from Chicago are showing that the adult males, um, that mothers mostly hang out with kids, and that the adult males also seem to be social with each other. So we're really interested now in taking social network data from our fields, from different field sites across our field seasons and um, doing some network-based diffusion analyses to look at how solutions um, to these problems are spreading throughout the social network. And that will give us an idea of how, um, how much of uh, this information is being acquired socially via observation of other animals solving these problems and how much of it is individual learning based on um, individual experience. So that's where we're sort of heading next with that project. Uh, in addition to looking at raccoons, we're also starting to do some more comparative work. We have um, striped skunks in Laramie that we've started tagging. Um, we've tagged 16 so far, and um, they are participating in some of our puzzle box experiments as well. And so the goal, um, the long-term goal, is to start doing comparative studies of behavioral flexibility across um, these sort of successful urban species in a, in a rural, across a rural urban gradient. So um, what we're doing currently is um, designing tasks that we can test for both, well, for raccoons skunks and coyotes. One massive problem in our field is um, trying to design tasks that are fair across these species that differ greatly in their morphology. Um, as I've shown you, raccoons, are um, they really love to manipulate objects. They're very dexterous. And so one concern I have is, are they just really good at solving these problems just because they're able to manipulate objects so well? Or how much of it is actually due to sort of cognition? And so what I want to do is basically take dexterity out of the equation and level the playing field across the species. And so one way that we're doing that is basically by just giving the raccoons, uh, I'll show you a reverse learning task where it's just two buttons. So these animals just have to push a button, um, which, and then we can probe sort of their, how much they understand about tasks, but they're not, um, they can equally sort of push a button uh, across the species. So we're taking reversal learning, um, we've taken it in captivity for all three of these species. I'll show you these results, and then we're also now taking it into the field. The reason we chose reversal learning is, one, it's a task. You can do with two buttons. And then two, it's a really classic test as well of behavioral flexibility uh, and inhibitory control. And so in reversal learning, you have a, a positive stimulus and a negative stimulus. So for example, a rat will learn that it presses um, this panel over here gets a food reward. If it presses this shape over here, it doesn't. And once the animal shows that it learns this association, this um, discrimination, then you switch the rewarded sides. Okay, so now the, um, the positive stimulus becomes a negative and the negative becomes a positive. And you ask how many errors does that animal make before it learns this new association between pushing this button and getting a reward. And you can just keep doing this back and forth and back and forth in what's called serial reversal learning. And when you do serial reversal learning, you can then generate learning curves to see, okay, once these animals are sort of seeing this same thing over and over again, do they learn this general rule that when it's what you're pushing is no longer rewarded, do you switch to the other side? And how quickly do you do that? And it's typically assessed by looking at the number of errors that these animals are making. So we wanted to take this test. It's pretty typically done uh, in the lab and, and move it into the field. But first we had to do some troubleshooting with our design and also just initially wanted to look at um, all three species in captivity as well. So um, the reason we chose these species is that they're all incredibly successful in urban habitats, um, the striped skunk, the raccoon, and the coyote, um, but they differ in their relative brain size. So striped skunks have the lowest relative brain size compared to raccoons and coyotes are um, higher. So based on the cognitive buffer hypothesis, we have two predictions. The first is that as successful urban species, all of these guys should do pretty well in this task, um, that they should all show a pretty high level of behavioral flexibility. However, if we compare performance, perhaps differences in performance can be explained by this difference in relative brain volume. 
So um, the first thing we've done is build these devices. We're calling them um, automated cognitive testing pods because we're hoping to, uh, once the reversal learning tasks are done, actually give them a number of different tasks. And basically the animals have to come off and push a button um, and they learn, uh, we do an initial discrimination um, learning where they have to learn, okay, I, I press the right button, I get food, I press the left one, I don't. And then once they've learned that, by reaching a criterion of nine out of 10 correct choices, we switch it on them. Um, and you'll see in these videos I'm gonna show you that we had to modify the design slightly for the skunks. They were having trouble pushing a vertical button, so now it's a sloped button. So, okay, there you go. Um, I don't also have time to get into all of our protocol, but just to say is the initial, um, when animals initially approach the device, they just got rewarded for just approaching, and then they get rewarded um, for just pushing a button. So they just generally learn button equals food. And then once they're doing that, then we switch and just start um, rewarding one side and that's random which side gets rewarded first. Uh, so that was a skunk trial in captivity. Um, I'll now show you a raccoon trial. So this was our initial design um, where it was a vertical face. So the raccoon <coughs> pushed the wrong button. We had a 10 second delay, which is their cost for making a wrong choice. And then it came back and pushed the correct button. Uh, we then move this to coyotes. Um, there's a National Wildlife Research Center in Utah that has a whole uh, colony of captive coyotes. So we, uh, Lauren went there. And um, as you'll see, coyotes are very much a different beast entirely. And so we actually had to do a lot of modifications just to get them to participate. But um, the sort of most striking one is that we actually ended up giving them foot pads. So they can basically just come up and paw. One of these pads is still connected to a button. Um, but they don't have to push the button with their, their nose or paw. And they're tested in these pretty uh, I mean, naturalistic outdoor enclosures that they have um, at this facility. So here's a very typical coyote trial. <laughs> <laughs> and this is after two months. We <laughs> spent two months getting this coyote to do that. So. Um, it was a, a very different process just to get them to participate. This is sped up, obviously, in the interest of time. Um, we, we did um, get one animal to actually do reversals and participate. So um, this animal, as you can see, pushing pedals and getting rewarded um, and successfully completing reversals. Uh, for the coyotes, we shortened that time delay from 10 seconds to 2 seconds because we saw that when it was a longer delay, they would just leave and not come back. Um, so we did have to make a number of modifications uh, to, to get them to participate. So um, just to give you that in picture form, um, here's our the max number of testing sessions that animals had. Um, and here's this line is the um, average number of uh, sessions it took them before they started achieving reversals. Um, so max number testing sessions before they achieved a reversal. So raccoons basically were getting to reversals on night one of testing. Skunks on like nights two, three. Coyotes, it took over two months to get them to achieve a reversal. So um, there's these massive differences in how these coyotes are approaching the world and interacting with novel objects compared to raccoons. And I think that they're they're both obviously very successful strategies, and they're very different strategies. Um, however, if you look at the data in terms of how they're actually learning, they're very similar. So once you sort of get coyotes to engage, then the, their actual sort of performance on these tasks is very similar across all three species. So here's just the discrimination learning. Um, and you can see here that um, Basically, all the species seem very similar. There's no real pattern emerging. Other than that, um, trial number is significant for skunks and raccoons, showing that they're learning this over time. Um, it is not significant for coyotes, but again, Amanda, remember that we had one successful coyote. So we do, we're currently trying to build up the sample size of coyotes, um, but take the coyote data with a massive grain of salt. Um, if you look at reversal learning, the most striking thing it should be that we just have a lot more raccoon data and that raccoons do a lot more than the other species. So we got, um, we were trying to get 30 reversals for them and we did get these for the raccoons for the most part. Um, but the skunks, um, we didn't get as many reversals and the coyote again was um, participated less. But again, as you can see, um, 
skunks, uh, raccoons, and coyotes are, well, coyotes are very up close, approaching significance in terms of learning this over time. Um, we're now taking this into the field. So our goal is to have fully automated devices. We can basically place them into the field and the pit tag of the animal is scanned as they approach. The computer in the program then knows who's there and what test they're on, so it gives them the appropriate test. Um, and they can do this on their own time in the field sort of whenever they want. And our goal is to eventually get these uh, um, in many different populations that, dif that um, differ on in terms of their urbanization. So here is uh, a raccoon, a wild raccoon participating in a trial and getting its food reward. This is taken from, this video was taken like four days ago. So this is very much in the beginning phases of this work, but it's working and we're, we're getting reversals in these wild raccoons. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, as I mentioned, our goal is to get this fully automated. So one, in it, um, one other sort of line of inquiry we're taking with this is actually <coughs> to um, have AI automatically recognize individuals. And so we just got a grant um, to do that. There's a paper that was published recently uh, doing automated species recognition. And so um, the PI of that project is actually my husband, so that's helpful. <laughs> so we're now taking that. Um, the next step and sort of building on that work to try and get automated recognition of individuals um, using our raccoon data set with deep uh, neural networks and if we can get that then we can start putting out these pods in a number of different populations that we haven't yet you know tracked and marked every individual. Um, so, so far we um, in terms of thinking about behavioral flexibility of these urban adapter species in particular uh, raccoons and hyenas we're finding strong evidence that they're very good at innovative <coughs> problem solving, that they're very capable learners. We haven't yet, um, in raccoons, we have not yet been able to look at social learning, but that's definitely on the agenda. In hyenas, I've done some studies with social learning and I've found limited influences of social learning on problem solving performance. But uh, I think that there's a lot more that needs to be done to really investigate social learning in hyenas. Um, and we've shown um, strong evidence in the raccoons that they're capable of repeated innovations. And we're still working on a task that really lets us get inhibitory control. Uh, but we'll be looking at that data with our, we'll be looking at that measure with our reversal learning tasks. Um, so in terms of thinking back to this cognitive buffer hypothesis, I do still think it offers some, I do still think it's a very worthy hypothesis to consider in terms of thinking about the evolution of intelligence and sort of the function of enlarged brains. Um, and we're looking at it from a bunch of different angles. Hopefully as this project goes on longer, we're going to actually be able to tie performance on these different tasks to a measure of fitness, um, but we're not there yet. Um, but we are also seeing some contradictory evidence like the, the fact that all three of these species, despite differing in relative brain volume, are performing similarly on this reversal learning task. So obviously we need to do a lot more work to really get at that, but that's one of the directions that we're heading in. So one consequence of studying uh, animal that's in everyone's backyards is that you get a lot of phone calls um, from people <laughs> saying, there's a raccoon in my attic, can you come get it out? Um, or, you know, the raccoons are sort of destroying my trash cans, can you deal with them? And uh, this has got us thinking a lot about the cognitions of so-called nuisance animals. And um, so my students and I recently wrote a review paper where we were thinking about what do we know about the cognitions of these nuisance animals? Um, and then also, is it possible that, that these same cognitive abilities that are enabling animals to survive and thrive in these urban habitats are actually sort of getting the most, um, the most intelligent animals into trouble? Right? So the same cognitive abilities that are enabling their success are potentially also leading them to uh, run into people and be killed. Um, so in other words, do smarter animals come into conflict with humans more frequently? Or in contrast, are smarter animals actually able to avoid conflict with humans? And so we looked at the literature to see what do we know about this topic. Um, I don't have time to get into everything that we looked at, but I just wanted to briefly highlight um, two types of cognitive abilities that we investigated. Uh, the first was neophilia and boldness. So these are different but related traits where basically neophilia is an attraction to novelty and boldness is a willingness to take risks. Um, and you can imagine that these traits are really helpful um, 
when animals are coming into new environments that they have never seen before, or when the environment is rapidly changing and they need to be able to find resources um, quickly. And there is some evidence of that. So um, in Great Tits, object neophilia um, allows these animals to exploit novel and unpredictable resources in urban environments, um, as well as um, tolerance of novel objects is found to be predictive of um, utilization of novel foods um, in urban environments. So we do see that these traits are potentially very helpful. At the same time, um, there's a classic example of a neophilic animal in the Kia. So this parrot um, in New Zealand that just loves new things, shiny things, really anything to play with. And so Kia are constantly getting into trouble because they're going to people's cars and picking up all the rubber. They're flying right up to people and stealing whatever they have. Uh, and so these, it's allowing them to exploit new resources, but it's also bringing them into direct conflict with people. Um, likewise, in Indonesia, there's these macaques that have learned to steal, usually tourists, um, sunglasses and phones. And then there's these locals that know if they feed the macaques, they can get those back. And then the tourist feeds the local, or the tourist pays the local. So it's like this whole <laughs> currency that these macaques have sort of come to, you know, have come to fruition because of their boldness and their attraction to these objects. So again, these same cognitive abilities that are enabling success are also bringing them into conflict. Likewise, innovative problem solving. We seen a lot of examples in this talk about how animals can solve new problems and how that can be very helpful for them. Um, and it, innovation has been shown to be able to sort of help animals to expand their ecological niche. Um, but at the same time, when you're expanding into human dominated areas, um, this is inherently going to bring you into conflict with people because the problems that you're solving are basically how to access human based resources. Um, and so there's some great examples of how animals are actually, basically there's this innovation arms race, right? Where people are building exclusion structures, like fences, especially electric fences, to keep animals out. And animals are learning how to break through those structures, right, by solving new problems. So, for example, elephants, uh, both Asian and African, have found ways to <coughs> dismantle electric fences, both by using uh, tree trunks and also their tusks which don't conduct electricity, and, or at least very little. And so they're able to basically knock down these electric fences and pass through them um, to get to people's crops. And it's the animals that are most able to solve these types of problems that are now sort of breaking through these structures. So you can see that there's this sort of arms race occurring. Um, another great example of this is in Toronto, they have a massive raccoon population. And so there was this big, very expensive effort lately to design the raccoon-proof trash can. And it was de deployed to great fanfare across Toronto, and it's like two months later, and raccoons are learning how to break into the raccoon proof of trash can. So again, these abilities of animals that are enabling success are also bringing them into conflict. Um, in terms of avoiding humans, I just want to highlight a few examples that we found that I think are very cool. There's a great study that came out recently showing that across the globe, species are um, becoming more nocturnal to avoid uh, humans. Uh, we, there's also a great study on urban marmosets showing that they avoid areas of um, heavy uh, sound pollution like farmers markets and things like that on certain days of the week. Um, chimpanzees in Uganda look left and right before crossing the road uh, to avoid cars. Um, and migration might even be a strategy that some animals are using to avoid um, areas that have high human activity levels, especially if that activity level is um, you know, predictable and seasonal. And so um, we're, basically this literature review showed us that there's, I think, a lot of potential and a lot we don't know, um, especially about nuisance animal cognition. But I think it's an exciting area um, to get into. And in particular, what we're learning is that um, learning more about cognition can help us to design better mitigation strategies in terms of trying to reduce human wildlife conflict. Um, so based on our results, um, that we've found and also this literature review, we are seeing some evidence that cognition may play a role in the success of urban um, wildlife. The same cognitive abilities, however, that enable success bring animals into conflict, uh, which often results in the deaths of those animals. Um, and a greater understanding of this cognition and use of species can help us improve mitigation efforts, both by designing more effective mitigation strategies and then also by basically 
um, endearing wildlife to people. So if you know your raccoon, the raccoon's really smart and it can solve these types of problems and look at all these cool things it can do, maybe then those people are less likely to actually use lethal methods to, to deal with a raccoon. Um, so I think, okay, I've got five minutes. Um, I think I want to just briefly tell you about another line of inquiry in my lab, because I know in the talk title I talked about individual and social influences on problem solving, and that's mostly dealing with this type of research. Um, so in my lab, in addition to the carnivore work, we also have a zebra finch project. Um, and there's just a couple studies I wanted to tell you about briefly. Um, and the first one is how thinking about how pair bonds might help individuals to solve uh, complex problems. So basically, in this study, we had a male and a female pair bonded zebra finch, and we trained these um, animals on a one sort of discrimination, so they each had partial knowledge of the problem, but together they had complete knowledge. So um, the female here was trained to discriminate blue versus purple. The male is follows her and then is trained to discriminate red versus green. Uh, and so the female follows him, and ideally they find the food reward. So in this task, we ask, can animals that have partial knowledge of a problem pool that knowledge to solve a multi-step problem? And then um, do pair bonds help? So if you're put in this maze with a conspecific who you're very, very familiar with, the same sex conspecific, um, do you perform worse or better than if you're put in this maze with your mate? Um, and so first, we do find that um, animals basically, uh, well, our training works. So that's always helpful to know. So this is our percent of trained individuals that make the correct decision um, and also lead through their trained partition. So it is evidence that animals um, are leading when they have the knowledge and then they're following when they're naive um, and that they might they make the correct decision. And then interestingly we do see that being in a pair bond, uh, being with your mate in this type of task helps a lot. In fact it actually helps uh, as much as being trained to solve the task. So it's this incredibly huge um, effect of being paired with your mate versus a familiar conspecific, which led us to ask why. You know, why are pair bonds like this important for solving this type of task? And so one possible explanation is that there's enhanced social learning between mates. These are not exclusive hypotheses. Another is that mates talk more, and so when they're talking more, they're synchronizing their behavior more. Um, and then another option as well is that they're less stressed when they're with their mates, so they're better able to solve these types of problems. Uh, we are we have not yet looked at stress, although that's um, something I want to do. And we're currently looking at communication, but I want to quickly tell you about a study where we looked at social learning. Um, so this study was done with Chris Pendleton, Catherine Phillip, Lauren Gillette, and Kevin Leland at the University of St. Andrews. And we basically asked, do zebra finches preferentially learn a copy of the choices of their mates versus a familiar conspecific? Um, so basically, um, as you can see in this video, we have a demonstrator bird who's feeding from uh, feeder that has vertical stripes, um, not feeding from this feeder that has horizontal stripes. And there's an observer here who is watching this. And the observer prefers horizontal stripes. We did a whole testing with wallpaper where we said, do you prefer vertical or horizontal? And strangely enough, they have a preference, a strong one, um, not always the same direction. But so this male here um, likes horizontal stripes. And this uh, bird here is feeding from the vertical one. So we ask, okay, do these birds copy the choice that, the, that is demonstrated to them, their non-preferred choice? Um, and is there a difference between birds watching their mate versus birds watching a familiar conspecific? And this was opposite sex conspecific demonstrated. Um, so we found first that birds do um, copy. So here's um, when they're watching a familiar opposite sex conspecific. Um, both males and females uh, change their, they basically go to their non-preferred feeder, the one that was demonstrated to them. Um, pair bonded females do the same. So when they're watching their mate, um, they preferentially choose the feeder that he's feeding from, even though it's not their preferred one. And males do the exact opposite. So when their mate is feeding from a feeder, they avoid that choice. Uh, so we thought about this a lot. We thought, well, this is very strange. How do we explain this result? And the only thing that we could come up with, um, excuse the anthropomorphism please, is that they're acting chivalrously. So basically we tested them during egg laying, which is a period of heightened um, resource demand for the females. And so we thought, okay, well maybe they're actually deferring to the females to um, give those females access to resources. 
So we did a follow-up test to look at this because as you can see in our previous test, they were tested um, sequentially. Um, and so we gave uh, paired birds, again in their egg laying phase, uh, a piece of food that they really, really, really like in a really tiny quantity. So cucumber is really tasty if you're a zebra finch. And we gave them a tiny little piece that can't be shared. And then we put it in a cage and we said, who eats it? And so first, um, and you know, do males to sort of in real time defer to their female mate. Um, so here, first of all, they find the food in basically the same amount of time. Um, so we don't see any difference in discovering the food. But when they've discovered the food, males don't eat it and females do. Even if, I mean, even when the male is by himself, he would eat it. So it does seem to go with this explanation that they're deferring resources um, to their mate during a period of heightened um, resource need. Unfortunately, we couldn't test um, opposite sex familiar conspecific non-mated pairs in this task because males just chase females around. Um, so we're trying to think of ways to, to test that um, in real time. But so far, this study shows us that zebra finches are using social information to make foraging decisions, but they don't all use that information in the same way. Um, and it appears that paired males are avoiding competing with their mates for food during this critical phase. Um, obviously, we would really like to now do this test across the breeding season, so not just during egg laying, but during all stages, um, and see if this result changes, um, but we have not yet had a chance to do that. And this is the last one, I promise. Um, the last study I wanted to tell you about gets at now thinking about personality and how that uh, impacts problem-solving performance. Um, and so this is a study led by Lisa Barrett, who's a PhD student in my lab, um, and collaboration with Jessica Marsh, who's an undergraduate student, and Neil Schumacher and Chris Templeton. So animal personality um, is basically individual differences um, that are stable across time and across context. And uh, this is something that's been shown in recent years to be having incredibly um, important uh, impacts for animals. And there's thought um, both to be sort of individual personality traits, so one animal might be shy, another bold. Um, so for example, if you have one fish, a stickleback, and there's food, but there's a um, predator, some sticklebacks will just leave, they, won't, they don't want anything to do with it. Uh, bolder animals will actually still approach the food, even though there's a predator present. So there's these sort of quantifiable differences in individual behavior. And these differences are stable across time or across context. Um, there's also suites of correlated traits um, that have been found. So animals that are bolder may also be more aggressive, may also exhibit less parental care, etc. Um, and so those are termed behavioral syndromes. So we wanted to ask, does personality predict performance on different problem-solving tasks? Um, and we did this with our zebra finches. And we said, first, do we even see evidence of personality in these birds? So do we find traits that are repeatable? Um, and if we do find these traits, how does it impact um, <coughs> problem solving performance? So for example, are bolder individuals going to be better at solving a task or faster at solving a task than shyer ones? So we have 41 zebra finches, um, and we put them through a number of different personality assessments. First, we looked at general activity. So basically, if you have a bird in a cage by itself, how much does it move around? Um, we also looked at neophobia. So basically, if you have a bird in a cage, you have food, here, but it's next to a novel object like a yellow croc. Uh, how long does it take a bird to feed, um, even though that strange object is there? Um, we also looked at mirror pecs um, to look at aggression. So here we have birds um, in front of a mirror, and basically um, our measure of aggression is how sort of much they peck at the mirror and how strongly. So zebra finches are smart, but not too smart. Um, we also have within group interactions, look at dominance. So here we have a bunch of birds in a larger flight cage. They're marked on their heads with pet safe paint so we can tell them apart from above. Uh, and then we look at priority, basically how much they access a food resource uh, that's limited. And then we have three different personality or problem solving tasks that we gave them, a string pulling task, a wire pulling task, and a lift pulling task. <coughs> So again, the same number of birds, they got 30 minutes, and we looked at do they solve and how long does it take them. So here's a string pulling video. You can see the birds have to inhibit this initial response to just go straight for the food that they see through this transparent tube. 
and actually pull the food out with the string. Um, we also looked at wire pulling. So here the birds have to again inhibit this initial response to just go straight for the food and they have to learn how to actually pull the wires out so there's enough space for them to stick their head in and get the seeds. And then we also had a lid flipping task where these birds had to basically take a lid off the top of this device and they did it in a number of ways, pecking it off or um, flying off with it. And then we looked, okay, do we see evidence for personality? And we do. So dominance, boldness, and activity were all repeatable across trials. Um, we also found that if you look at their performance, their problem solving tasks, persistence is repeatable across trials. Uh, when we think about are there any sort of related personality traits akin to sort of a behavioral syndrome? We see some evidence, but um, it's not significant that um, birds that are more active are also um, bolder. So average latency to feed is our measure of boldness. So birds down here are bolder, and then they're also more active. Um, when we look at problem solving, we actually see these really interesting sex differences. Um, so this was our easier task and these are our more difficult tasks and females are more successful than males on these tasks and I don't know why so that's something we're still thinking about. Um, when we look at do pro uh, personality measures predict problem solving success we see um, that in the string pulling task this was the first task they all received older birds do better um, however that didn't hold for the other tasks so it's possible that they just get used to testing and boldness <coughs> sort of phase in, in terms of importance um, sex was most predictive of wire removal success, as I showed you in that graph, and then persistence was most predictive of success on the lid flipping task. This is actually our hardest task for them. So it was the, uh, the, the task that they had the most trouble on, the more persistent birds were more successful. We're now running, um, those are all sort of looking at each personality measure individually. We're now running um, PCAs and other things to look at these personality measures. Um, it, as sort of more multi-dimensional traits, but uh, that's something that we're doing now. And then we're, in terms of moving forward, we're now saying, okay, is there, do, does the personality combination of a pair matter? So not all pair bonds are equal, maybe some pairs are more compatible than others, and how much does it have to do with personality compatibility? There's evidence from literature that similar personalities do better, and also maybe that dissimilar personalities do better, depending on the environment. We're also looking at relationship quality in terms of pair bond duration, um, and if a bird is just able to choose its mate, or if you only give it one choice, um, does that affect sort of the quality of the relationship and then how well they do on these cooperative problem solving tasks like the maze task. Uh, and then we're also now looking at communication between partners. And that is where I'm gonna end. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm sorry I went over, but thank you very much. Exclusively at um, species that have been successful. Yeah. And I was, and, and you're looking at this in a comparative way. And I was wondering um, why you haven't also included species that haven't been successful to, um, and the prediction would be that those that have sort of stayed in their um, uh, natural rural environments wouldn't have like they wouldn't have all of these skills. And I, I recognize there's all these challenges to get new species and trying to figure out the toolbox, but um, are there like um, sort of natural species that haven't broken into urban areas that are similar in their um, sort of dexterity or like physical presentation as raccoons and skunks that might provide a more formative contrast than just looking at only ones that have been successful? Yeah, that's definitely, it's a great question. It's definitely something that we have been thinking about and want to do. Um, logistically, it's more difficult. Uh, so raccoons, within the raccoon family, um, you know, there's coatis, they're very successful. Um, and then there's also actually some other animals like crab, crab eating raccoons um, that aren't, but they're also endangered. And so to actually, and they're very limited in where they can be found. So to do those kinds of studies, it's just a lot, it's a whole 
I don't know. It takes a lot of work to get to that point with them. So it's something we really want to do, but I just haven't yet had the resources to do that. Um, for our skunks, we are hopefully going to start a comparison with spotted skunks. Um, but again, that's something that's, you know, in my goals for a few years from now, but not something I've been able to tackle yet. But I'd love to do it. And if you think of any other species that would be a great comparative group, I would be really <coughs> excited to, to talk to you about that. Yeah. Thank you. It's very interesting. Thank you. Um, thinking about these vast individual differences in the problem solving abilities in, in both the hyenas and the raccoons and so so one possibility is trade-offs and so this idea that perhaps the smarter ones are also the ones that are more likely to be killed by people so that's that's one kind of possible trade-off but I wonder if you've considered like what other trade-offs there might be because it seems like if there aren't trade-offs then there must be pretty strong selection in favor of having those sophisticated problem solving abilities and you'd expect them to rapidly you know to characterize the entire, the entire population so i mean like like one thought could be that the more innovative ones are the, also like the more likely to be like social outcasts like they they're not they're not good at, at interacting with conspecifics or so, some kind of trade-off right uh again it's a great question i i think I've been thinking about it more in terms of different environments are good for some <coughs> some environments it's really helpful to be super innovative or super bold and in some environments it's actually really helpful not to be and so the environmental variability maintains <coughs> that variation in the population but um, in terms of other trade-offs the, yeah the classic ones are yeah if you're more innovative or bolder then you're also you know you're taking more risks and you're going to come across poison and all these other things so um, off the top of my head, I don't know of other trade-offs other than you know energy towards your brain and things like that. But um, from in my head, it's mostly thinking about environmental variation. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really great talk. Very very exciting stuff. Um, and I was wondering, um, how do you? like just following up what you were just describing about environmental variability. So I, I work with um, hunter-gatherers and they create anthropogenic landscapes also, but vastly different than obviously an urban landscape that, that you're working, the area that you're working in. Um, but then when you think also about across these different anthropogenic landscapes that one could be studying, um, like just take the United States, for example. Um, if you want to look at what kinds of selection is now taking place on other species because of these different human altered environments, um, do you, have, have you developed a way to characterize these different anthropogenic environments? For example, if you were going to study selection in Los Angeles uh, versus San Francisco or Las Vegas, or because because all these different anthropogenic environments are varying so much on yeah. along different spectra. Like um, the richness of the environment is probably going to be different. The complexity of the environment is going to be different. So is there is there is that still a wide open area, or is that something that you're working on, like trying to trying to nail down what it is about a, a, the anthropogenic environments that are that are and what kind of selection is is a consequence of that. Um, so, the, of the studies that have been done, sort of comparing cognition or behavior um, in, you know, areas that vary in their degree of urbanization, mm -hmm. the way urbanization has typically been quantified is by basically looking at, like, a, a um, top-down view, like a Google Earth-type yeah. view, yeah. and then, uh, saying for you know the different pixels how much of it is concrete versus green space okay. and then giving areas different urbanization scores based on how sort of built up they are okay. um, within those areas and there's some you know other details people can add to that like houses versus you know whatever but pretty much it's like how much is built up versus how much is still green space um, so that's the approach has been taken so far as far as I know but I think there's it's a great question and I don't 
I mean, one green space is not equivalent to another, mm -hmm. and some concrete is not, you know, mm -hmm. necessarily equivalent to others. Uh, and people use urban areas in very different ways, and so I think that it's still very much wide open as to really how we're going to talk about urbanization and what it really means. Yeah. On, the, on the same topic, um, you, you, you um, sort of start with the assumption that animals are coming into contact with humans, mm -hmm. and that it's a, you know that's what makes urban ecology interesting. But it, it might be fair to assume that they've already spent several generations, sure. you know, a significant amount of time adapting to us in some ways. I'm wondering if you are either doing or thinking about doing any kind of phylogenetic work on your population of raccoons that are solving these tasks to figure out. Um, whether there's any correlation with these individuals who are really good and <coughs> what populations they might come from or want to. I haven't thought about doing that yet. Um, my approach to that so far, in, in my thinking, I haven't put it into action yet, yeah. uh, is thinking about sort of how populations, you know, vary in their degree of urbanization and thinking about how um, really rural populations compare to edge yeah. Population versus really urban population, but I haven't thought about a, you know, a phylogenetic approach mm -hmm. to it. Uh, I do think it's a great question, and I think there's also some natural experiments you can find where you know areas where it's the people have just moved there, whatever. You can find populations that have been more or less disturbed by humans over time, and then try to do some comparisons like that. But uh, yeah, I do assume that these animals have been in contact with humans for a while, and I'm sure that has important. Uh, implications for their behavior and their function. Yeah, so I think this is a somewhat similar question. But the um, the animals who are in captivity, who are there, have they been, were they trapped because they were nuisance animals and brought in, or are there some animals who were born in captivity who've been provisioned their entire lives, and so they wouldn't have had to kind of learn the scrounging skills and things like that that might be the important that they're using to yeah. solve these tasks? Um, so these, the raccoons and skunks that we've been using are either in that facility, wild caught, where they just go out and, and trap, so it's not just nuisance animals, or there are a few animals that were born into captivity, and actually all the animals that solved the Aesop's task were litter mates whose mother was a wild caught mom who was pregnant, and so they were born into captivity. Um, and then there's also animals that are uh, from fur farms, so basically they're purchased for to use as research animals. Um, so we've tried to mostly stick to the wild cut animals as much as possible in our studies, but um, they're definite. They don't have they don't keep animals there for that long to have um, too many captive born animals, but. Um, I do, I know from my hyena work, for example, we did a, a comparison of performance on problem solving tasks between captive and wild hyenas and found marked differences. So the captive animals were much, much more successful than the wild animals on the same exact task. Um, and so I don't doubt that there's an important captivity effect. Uh, but it's nice to see both in the hyena study and in this raccoon study, even though there's these um, huge differences in success. The sort of general um, performance in terms of you know having uh, the way they solve the problems or sort of the results in terms of learning and behavioral um, diversity being important and you know having no solvers or multi-solution solvers like those kinds of things seem to be constant but there are definitely captivity effects that we have to think about. Yeah. I wanted to ask about um, the domain specificity, domain generality um, distinction. So it seems like, depending on how you conceptualize it, some people might think of something like extractive foraging as being a specific domain, right? Where sure. It would be different than social intelligence or spatial navigation or something like that. Um, and so I wonder what the different species that you're looking at when you're looking for correlations between brain size. Ask, but I'm wondering if there's some aspect of this where it might be different degrees of fit between the problems that they're solving and something about their natural ecology. Presumably, because I think of, you know, for example, the coyotes, when you look to you have very much data, yeah. they don't do a lot of extractive foraging, right? Um, yeah. 
in the wild. And they also seem to be hesitant to approach the device. So I, I'm just wondering, is, is there an element of this that isn't just domain general cognition, but that might actually be specialized? Yeah. I mean, it's a huge, it's a, it's a big thing in our field, thinking about, is, this, is there even such a thing as general intelligence? And um, you know, what is sort of, how do we measure general intelligence versus very specific cognitive abilities? And um, so for our purposes, we're thinking about um, can animals solve new problems in like flexible ways as being s some measure of certain general intelligence, but it is also quite likely to be tied to things like extractive foraging. And so I think <coughs> ideally uh, we would basically test all of these species on a huge number of different tasks to get, because it's, it's quite possible that their performance on one task will be different than their performance on another. Um, so the end goal is to really get as many of these different types of tests into the field as we can. Uh, we're starting with innovative problem solving um, and these types of tasks. One, because I think they're important, and then two, um, it's also sort of a, a task that I, I can get them to engage in um, pretty easily, with the exception of coyotes. Uh, <laughs> but I do think there's something still there. So our results showing this connection between brain size and performance on the task, I think tells us that there is something cognitive there and it is measuring something like general intelligence, but obviously we have a ways to go to really know what we're measuring. For your between species comparisons, you briefly mentioned the struggle of designing fair tasks and specifically with respect to dexterity being an issue. It occurs to me that you might even expect dexterity to co-evolve with problem-solving intelligence. It seems to me that it opens up the ability to manipulate the world to kind of a greater extent you know, than if you don't have dexterity, such that you might expect that co-evolution. So if you're methodologically trying to control that away, you might be using losing something useful there. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, yeah, I do think that's right. I think that we do see, I mean, dexterity obviously has a huge impact on neural development, and like we see, you know, in raccoons, a huge portion of their brain is is, develop, is devoted to like sensory aspects, right? And so, um, I I don't doubt that there is a connection between dexterity and cognition, and that there's probably some sort of you know relationship where they go back and forth. But I I do. It's hard to. I mean, within all of these experiments, right, you have to try and control for most things so you can actually get at what your question of interest is. So I don't doubt that dexterity is helping raccoons to solve these problems, but I also want to understand what they understand about these problems. And so for that, I'm trying to take dexterity out of the equation. I don't know if that answers your question. I, I guess I'm suggesting that having dexterity might select for greater problem solving ability. I mean, n not just bigger brains to, to handle the hardware, but but right. like, what's the point of having the extra uh, hardware if you can't do more advanced stuff with it, such that you would expect the problem solving abilities to co-evolve with dexterity, generally speaking. This is okay. just a wild hypothesis. Yeah, no. I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I always wanted to do a study with otters, and I think it'd be really interesting. Um, for many reasons, but one reason is that you have these species that are quite similar in terms of their morphology, but you have sea otters that use tools and other otters that don't, even though they could. Really could. Um, so I think maybe you need a system like that where you have multiple species that with, control. yeah. I'm not sure how to get, maybe with raccoons if you could find like another type of raccoon to compare to. Um, but yeah, it is, yeah, it's definitely something that, to keep thinking about. Are, are there studies that have looked at the demographic rates of these different species in urban environments versus their, I guess you would say, control source populations? Because, I mean, just to look at, because, um, you know, the highly abundant food sources in some urban environments is going to have an impact on um, population growth rates. Uh, and 
some species might respond to an increase in food supply differently than others. And, yeah. And is there is there work in this in this field that's looking down at, at like some of the demographic levers that are being in, in, in the process of animals successfully colonizing um, urban environments? Like if it's I think the, approach to it? the best um, example I can think of for that, it would be Stan Garrett's work out of um, Ohio State University, and he's studying urban carnivores in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Uh, and outside areas of Chicago, and so he's doing, his focus has been mostly on ecology and um, yeah, pop, like densities of populations and space use and uh, how home range size differ based on resource availability and things like that. So I think that, and he does, he looks at coyotes um, and raccoons, so he's, he's doing comparative work in that respect. Um, but Otherwise, it's, I don't know, we're, I think people are getting more interested in urban wildlife and raccoons, but I, we, there, we still don't have a lot of great data. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.